Rachel Fletcher, and welcome back to All About Canadian Books. This week's guest is Tannis Rideout, and she is the author of, oops, there we go, The Sea Between Two Shores. If you missed my Get to Know Tannis interview, I will put a link down below in the description box so you can watch it. This segment, we are going to concentrate on learning the story behind Tannis's book, which I think always makes a book so much more interesting to know the author and the story. Now, The Sea Between Two Shores was really a compelling read. I just finished this weekend, loved it. I mean, Tannis tackles to so many things in the novel from grief, the impact of colonialism, um, reconciliation, the environment. And I'm not going to go on. I'm going to let Tannis explain a little more what her novel is about. It's and it, it's beautiful. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, it's um, a story about two families who have a long distant uh, collective history and who come together in the in contemporary times to reckon with their collective past, but also with their own griefs and difficulties, both within their families and across these two families as well, trying to find, find ways to be better. Yeah. Yeah. Now, it's what I, as I have said, you know, love to know the story behind the book. And you have a very interesting story of how this book got started. Can you share with our viewers where this idea percolated? And yeah, th this book was a bit of a, it, it felt like a bit of a gift. So um, I was lucky enough to travel to uh, Oceana about five years ago now, maybe slightly more. Um, and my husband and I went to uh, Vanuatu and to Fiji. And um, yeah, it was pretty, <laughs> pretty extraordinary places. And uh, we started in Vanuatu and we were staying on this very small island in the south of Vanuatu called Tana and just staying at this little bungalow and they had you know like guidebooks that have been left behind by previous guests and that kind of thing and so we're just you know sitting looking at the ocean and reading through some of these books and I had no intention of writing about Vanuatu when we went it was supposed to be like kind of this like cleanse like restore everything like after a couple of years of like output mm -hmm. and uh in this book, there was this like just this little paragraph about um, missionaries who had come to the island and been killed, and they, but they were Canadian missionaries, and so that kind of caught me because I was like <laughs> very far away from the east coast of Canada uh, when you're in Vanuatu, and I was like, oh, that's interesting, and I was like, oh, I wonder if there's like a story to tell there, and I mean, it was like, no, like I I don't know how to tell that story in a way that we haven't already heard it a zillion times that isn't just like another colonial retelling of you know these um encounter stories and so I just kind of put it away and we like continued on our trip and um Vanuatu was just it was such so different from anywhere that I had traveled before and it took up a lot of mental real estate in my brain so even after we came back I kept reading what I could find about the island and the people and the history and um and came across through that came across uh the story of this reconciliation ceremony that had happened on the island between the descendants of different missionaries who had been killed and the descendants of the new Vanuatu who had been on the island at the time and I was like oh that's interesting maybe that's a way to kind of come into this story that isn't just about this first moment this first encounter story but like pulls it forward into the present day and gives us something slightly different yeah 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 no I mean that's incredible <laughs> it's, yeah like you just think of the synchronicity involved like finding yeah <laughs> like it's just obviously the muse was waiting for you waiting yeah for you. it's you know it's being being open to yeah. to to things you know and um so that yeah when you know when the 
thing stops in front of you, you can be like, oh, that, that might be worth like digging out a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. And one of the things that I'm not one of, I should say, one of the many things I found really interesting about your book was you used cultural consultants. And um, I don't know for viewers, if can you explain, first of all, what that is and then kind of what the process was? Yeah, absolutely. Um, So for me, a cultural consultant is essentially somebody that you hire who is from the place, the culture um that you're writing about it's another research tool in in a way in the same way that you know like you would interview a doctor if you were you know working on a you know medical drama or that kind of thing and so um yeah I was lucky enough to reach out uh, sort of through various different contacts and just research online to a number of people in Vanuatu and across Oceania and um they were kind enough to agree to like get read the book which is a big ask it's a lot to ask somebody uh to even to be paid to spend time with an unfinished manuscript so it's not (laughs) even like in this like tidy like hopefully tidy edited proofread version I mean I always tried to send them the best version that I could um but part of the process is like getting feedback and then you know changing things and um so to have sort of various people across Vanuatu all of whom were incredibly enthusiastic about the project to begin with and then were um excited to be able to like offer input and correct me in places or help articulate things that I wasn't quite grasping or um, sort of direct me towards names because names are to are attached to very specific places and, and those sorts of things. And um, it just gave this whole sort of new vibrancy to, to the book and to the process, honestly, mm-hmm. like the idea of like having people who it's meaningful for be like oh this is like working really well but this over here wouldn't happen like this and then kind of opening a door for for me to walk through to be like oh I would never have gone in this direction without sort of this this feedback so yeah I had had different people read it at different points in time and um just bring their expertise and their knowledge and their lives to it which is just such a gift really yeah, it it sounds incredible. And as a writer, um, Tannis, like, what did you learn from working with these consultants? Yeah, it's, I will admit that, like, sort of at the outset, it was pretty intimidating, you know, like, you're yeah. writing about something <laughs> yeah. kind of very far removed from my own experience from my, and I, you know, I was trying to do my best. And I, you know, did as much yeah. research as I could on paper. And but like, you want them to not be insulted like that you hopefully you haven't done something terribly wrong or said (laughs) something really offensive or any of those sorts of things so it was it was nerve-wracking it was even nerve-wracking to initially reach out but um most people love to talk about their place and their people you know like having people come visit LA where I want to show show it off right and like um and so I think if if you go into it knowing that like you're entering a, a dialogue, you're entering kind of a conversation, mm-hmm. um, it takes that kind of pressure off of it. And yeah. that um, that people were so excited to be engaged in a project. And we were, they were excited that, you know, somebody who has no real connection was, was interested in their place mm-hmm. and in their lives. And, um, so yeah, to have that kind of um, exchange was, yeah, it was really great. It felt really good. It was something I was like, I w- would do it again in a second for a different project. And yeah. Um, yeah, I think we kind of get a bit more hung up on the idea of talking to a cultural consultant versus like a doctor for a medical show, because yeah. we're sort of feeling like there's this, you know, there's a moral difference in it or something and I feel like we're just asking people to share their expertise in this case their expertise is their life and not just their profession and I you know like I'm not a mom when I write 
moms, I talk to moms, you know, <laughs> yeah, like, exactly. I, yeah, yeah. you know, like I can extrapolate and I can, you know, empathize and I can, but yeah. like, I, I want my mom friends to be like, yeah, yeah, no, that's, that's what it's like. Yeah. 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 Now, what role do you think that, um, fic- like fiction novels can play with reconciliation? Because yeah, it, it, I, it's, I mean, it's such a massive, conversation at, at the yeah. moment at, yeah. everywhere I mean it's yes it's, in Canada it's such a big conversation and mm-hmm. um here it happens in different ways and across the world and, but I also have been thinking about it as well like in even reconciling in personal relationships or you know like mm-hmm. in your family in you know we're not we're not good at we're not good good at apologizing we're not good at accepting apologies um and uh I've been just thinking about that a lot and I think so much of it there's a reason that you know it was the truth and reconciliation project is because you need the stories first in order to Mm -hmm. to reconcile and I think fiction let certainly lets me as a writer and I hope well and I do know it lets me as a reader Mm -hmm. step into emotions that I don't necessarily have to live in it lets me use that empathetic imagination to try and contemplate somebody else's life what that feels like for them and I think sometimes too fiction can feel not sorry non-fiction can feel like work um and you know we should be doing that work but I think what I hope for a novel like this or similar novels is it allows people who maybe aren't going to pick up a book about a nonfiction book about reconciliation or, uh, but might allow them a door in to start talking about some of those things. I think like, you know, I hope that this book finds its way into book clubs and that people can use this story as a way to start talking about, how they how they can make movements in their own lives um it's a little bit like a spoonful of sugar (laughs) you know like if it's not so much about like you need to do this or you are responsible for this if it's more of a like hey maybe through these characters you can be open to a little bit more of what another story might sound like yeah, yeah. And I know reading your novel, like in, in particular, we, when we went back in time when, you know, Josephine and William, the, the missionaries first arrived on the island, all prepared to change things like it, it's actually quite shocking, you know, reading that narrative of, of what their belief systems were. Um, so, um, and w- when you were researching, was there anything that surprised you? For sure. Like on the, yeah. well, I mean, certainly like on the missionary side of things, I think again, like one of the things that really first struck me was that these were Canadian missionaries who had gone yes. to this place. Yes. Like yeah. that, you know, like again, thinking about colonization and like yeah. understanding yeah. or having learned about, you mm-hmm. know, the colonization of Canada by white yeah. settlers but then this idea that there was this uh, another leap from Canada to go and colonize yeah. this other yeah. place as well and it was like there was this there I think also because the Maritimes were so connected to um Scotland and those those particular like Protestant it was like these Scotch Protestants yeah. often yeah. and like and so like that kind of circle I found really surprising and interesting and my family's originally from the Maritimes and Mm -hmm. um they were not missionaries but it felt like but they they could have been they would have known people like this they would have you know have been like they probably were going to churches that were supporting this and so like that I that was sort of the initial surprise of it it was just that yes it it opened another way of looking at colonialism for me that I hadn't thought about before. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that was my, and then to like read what I did read and learn what I was able to learn about the various beliefs across Vanuatu, which changes from like 
over a very small space yeah. tremendously um, was like constantly interesting and, and surprising and yeah. um you it's easy to forget just how big the world is sometimes you know we live yeah. in our little bubbles and we yeah. um but that yeah it's like it's in trying to imagine yourself into a fundamentally different way of thinking and being and believing is it's, um it's a great exercise I think we, yeah. people would be ser well served to do more of it yeah and I I really appreciate it I mean we have lots of different voices in your novel but we don't hear from Josephine or William which I thought was a really interesting way of going about structuring no your novel was this conscious right from the onset no no okay. no I had initially started with writing uh, it was letters and diaries from uh, mm -hmm. from Josephine. So there's an entire version of that story from Josephine's point of view. Mm -hmm. And I, because one of the things that interested me was that like Josephine has power in this place, but she's also kind of been forced to come to this place as well and so I was interested yeah. in that kind of disconnect between her and William and like yeah. how willing a participant she was in mm -hmm. this or not and um which I think still kind of percolates through because I had done all of that writing beforehand um but it, yeah at some time at some point in time during the editorial process um I my editor suggested trying it from a different point of view and that was another time that felt like a real step outside it was like yeah. now it's also this historical context and um you know and I was I was talking to a friend at one point in time about like trying to write this you know young teenage girl and I was like I'm not sure that she would quite fit in this world and and my friend was like oh there have there have always been spunky teenage girls all over the world and I was like you're right <laughs> you're right there have always been teenage girls like giving a huge mm -hmm. blow off to like whatever parental authority <laughs> and uh, I was like right it was there once she sort of said that I felt like I kind of had this permission to to yeah. imagine fine it kind of into this fullness and like think about what she would want from these mm -hmm. people why why would she be drawn to them why would she like yeah. you know and she is fairly powerless in her world and this was a way for her to kind of grasp some power and once I kind of found that she sort of spark to life yeah she was one of my favorites actually oh, good. <laughs> yeah and another interesting thing that I really um and appreciated was you know we have two families in mourning we've got you know our North American family Rebecca and our sorry no Michelle and then we've got the local family Rebecca mourning mourning her son and it was so interesting the way different cultures mourn mourn the dead and also different personalities um with these two women um do you think do you think that personality played the bigger part in their mourning choices yeah i think for michelle i always thought of as also having the luxury of of being able to sort of stay in her mourning in a way that yeah. Rebecca does not like yeah. it's yeah. you know it's sort of another version of privilege yeah. that in some ways undoes her because mm -hmm. she's allowed to fall apart she's allowed to you know like because there will be other people there to pick things up there will be like she's being given the space to, to do that and Rebecca doesn't have that luxury Rebecca needs yeah. to like get on with the day-to-day -day, which is just so much harder which is just you know the physical labor of like what life is like yeah. um as a subsistence farmer on one of these islands and um so I think in that way it was it was cultural for sure yeah. um and also that I think that you know in North America and the Western world we I feel like this is hopefully changing a little bit but we try not to look at death we try not to like you know we don't talk about illness we don't talk about we don't want to talk about getting old we don't want to talk about all of these these things versus it being a communal 
thing. Like we've kind of tried to put it over there in a box or at the hospital or, you know, versus um, it being something that is for the community, that all of the community is, is mourning. Michelle wants her grief to herself and she yeah. wants her grief to be more valuable than everybody else's grief. And yeah. Rebecca shares her grief and her people, her family, mm -hmm. her, the women in her um, place share her grief with her. And that is meaningful for her. It helps her, it helps her carry it because other people are also carrying her son yeah. with them. Yeah. You know, as a reader, I, I just kept thinking we have, you know, through your words, we have so much to learn from other cultures. We, we yeah, really I do. think, yeah. And I think there's, um, there's so much out there again, like, you know, and I think we're seeing more and more, like we're seeing more interesting and varied TV shows. We're seeing like those books yes. are out there. There are great novels written by oceanic novelists and poets. And um, that was such a great part of research too, was like reading about an ent the entire other yeah. side of the world of being sort of forced out of, the books that I normally read and the books that I, you know, I'm kind of comfortable with sort of traditional ways that we tell stories and then kind of reading kind of collected oral tales and just being like, oh, there are entire different ways to tell stories, let alone even what the stories are about. And, yeah. Um, but yeah, there are just so many different modes of thinking. And I think, you know, we need to be careful not to just like continue to pick and choose little bits from, the, yeah. you know, like yeah. and take them out of context and, you know, do what we will with them. But at the same time, I think not trying to comprehend what other peoples might have to offer, other ways of doing things, other ways of resolving issues. There's some people are, other people are doing some of that way better than we are. So <laughs> yeah, we'd be, exactly. you know, we should, we should try and learn. Exactly, exactly. Oh, Tannis, you have made me want to go to the other side of the world, let me tell you. <laughs> yeah, do it. it. You will not be disappointed. It's a uh, pretty, oh. pretty extraordinary places there. Oh, my goodness. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me today. It's been Thank such you. a pleasure. I appreciate it. And for viewers, I'll just show this again, the sea between two shores. I will put a link down below in the description box so you can purchase a copy of this beautiful novel. Also a link to Tannis's website so you can check out what she's up to. And please come back in a couple weeks. I have Bianca Maris and she will be talking about her book, The Witches of Moonshire Manor. Thank you everyone for watching and thank you again, Tannis. Yeah. Bye.